Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to kick around with you the topic of muscle action. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be talking about movement. Pretty important stuff. And, you know, movement, being that it's a dynamic side of, sort of thing, uh, is in, involving muscles, and it's involving in particular skeletal muscles. And again, skeletal muscles, if you're not familiar with it, are the type of muscles that are attached to the skeletal system. And they have a uh, in a variety of functions and their organization is built upon the fact that they have their fascicles arranged in one of four kinds of types and patterns if you will of, of organization there it could be either parallel convergent uh, pinnate or circular and what i mean by fascicles in case you're uh, unfamiliar with that is that the whole muscle itself is surrounded by a type of connective tissue called epimesium. Yeah, that's right, epi meaning upon. And then inside the muscle, you can see these little units in here, and these are the fascicles. And, and again, here's a, here's a better look up here. So these fascicles could be, uh, and the fascicle I might add themselves are surrounded by connective tissue uh, called perimesium. But the thing is, they could either be, uh, here's a better picture of the, the fascicles, uh, lined by perimesium. They could either be parallel or they can be convergent or they could be unipinnate or bipinnate or multiple pinnate or circular. And that's where we're going to get into a conversation about these uh, fascicles and, and their arrangement. And then we're going to get into uh, talking a little bit about um, muscle action. And I hope, uh, I hope it's useful. First off, the name parallel sort of suggests uh, what the fascicles are all about. In other words, the biceps brachii is an example of this. You can notice here that the uh, fascicles are running in a parallel orientation along uh, the central axis uh, of the muscle. Okay? Uh, another example of this is the rectus abdominis. You can notice here that they're, and this is found uh, in, the, in the front uh, interior of your body right here. Notice how the, the muscles uh, are running in, uh, in parallel. And uh, you could also have uh, these muscles sort of wrapping around, uh, forming uh, the ability for the joint to supernate. In other words, when the forearm supernates uh, at the, the radio ulnar joint, in other words, it sort of comes around like this holding the, the palm upward, supernate. Uh, an example of a convergent muscle. And again, that sort of implies that the fact that the fibers are sort of coming uh, uh, and converging or attaching to the tendon right there. And a, a classic example of that is the pectoral, por, pectorialis muscle in your chest. Okay, so that's a convergent muscle type. Now these pennate muscles are pretty pretty interesting to me. I'm going to slow down a little bit on this. And they, they form angles uh, with the tendon. And, the, you know, the, the truth is they don't move as far as parallel muscles, but in the end, they contain more myofibrils, which are proteins that help contract actin and myosin, than the parallel muscles. And so therefore, they have a little bit more force, okay? and they can develop a little bit more tension than the parallel muscle. And that way is, uh, the reason is that they can pack in just more muscle fibers, allowing them to produce more force. So let's take a look at these. There's three kinds of pinnate muscles, and there's one that's uni, meaning one pinnate, whereas the fibers are on one side of the tendon right here. Uh, uh, extensor uh, uh, muscle in your, in your forearm is an example of that. Let's take a look right there. The, um, it, where it's extending uh, the fingers and wrist right there. So that's uni. Okay. Now the bipinnate uh, is where there's uh, fibers on, on both sides of the tendon. Uh, really large muscle in, in, your, um, in your thigh, in your quadricep, uh, your rectus femoral, femoris uh, <laughs> is an example of that. Right there, bipinnate. And then you have multiple pinnate, and your deltoid is an example of that. Now check that out, the tendons branch within the muscle here. Right in here, an example is the deltoid, multiple pinnate. And uh, here's a, a fleshy look at, uh, you can see the tendons uh, uh, innervating uh, inside the muscle fiber at this point. And then you have your uh, circular muscles. And these, these make up, that sometimes they're just simply called sphincters, uh, these circular muscles. 
we have several sphincters. We have, uh, you know, the, the anus is a, is a sphincter, and we also consider the pylorus sphinx, sphincter, uh, which is the gatekeeper of uh, the, the small intestine and the large intestine. But in, in one, one of the most obvious is the, is the mouth or uh, orbe, orbicularis uh, oris, okay? And that particular muscle of the mouth is able to contract and then relax, and uh, as you can watch me talking. So that's an example of a, a circular muscle or sphincter. Now I want to sort of shift gears a little bit, maybe pun intended on that, uh, and talk about the, the fact that muscles as they interact with bones to make actions are uh, an example of levers or levers, depending on how you want to pronounce that. But these levers are the simplest type of machine. And so what they do is they allow the muscle when it attaches to the skeleton to produce motion. Okay, And the various types of muscle attachment affect the power, the range, and the speed of muscle movement. And so I find that levers are something that most people are familiar with, but perhaps you weren't familiar with this is the, this is the mechanism that the muscles and skeletons use in order to uh, exert force to move objects. And so mechanically, just to establish a few things, mechanically each bone is the lever. So it's the rigid moving structure. And then you have a, the joint, which acts as a fulcrum. Now the fulcrum is sort of that pivot point or the, or the fixed point, if you will. So muscles apply and provide force or effort. So it's an applied force. That's what, what it's doing when it's contracting. And that's what is required to overcome the load. Okay, so if the applied force is more than the load, you're gonna be able to move the load via the lever. Okay, and so basically the function of the lever is to change the direction, so it's to change the direction of an applied force, the distance and speed of the movement produced by uh, the applied force, and effective and affect the strength of the uh, of of the applied force as well. Okay, and so let's take a look at the three classes of levers. And so uh, this is going to be my best explanation, but I just want to point out a little something. Perhaps a better way to look and, and understand levers is to simply try them out uh, physically yourself. And, and again, it, this is one of those things that sort of talking about them and discussing it isn't enough. You have to sort of experience them. And so let me do my best to try to use my words to, to explain what is happening here. So the levers depend on the relationship between the applied force, fulcrum, and resistance. Okay, And there's three classes, as I mentioned before first class, second class, and third. The first class is an exemplified by you know, your, your classic guy right here. And here, this sort of po pivot point right here is the fulcrum right there. And so he's applying effort in a, in a downward direction. And therefore, this, this rod right here represents sort of the bone. And then therefore, you're going to be able to hoist the, this box up. Okay, even though the load is, is, is coming down and putting, putting force right here. And then the second lever is going to be a wheelbarrow. And, I'm, and basically, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the location of the fulcrum and where the load is being put and how the effort uh, is overcoming the load. And then the third class lever is a little bit of a sort of a, um, an example of where you're trying to shoot uh, a rock over a, a castle. In other words... Uh, get to that. <laughs> uh, and so the, the first class lever is uh, an example of that is, is your basic teeter-totter. Okay, so the teeter-totter uh, uh, basically is um, being supported by this fulcrum right here. And it's the center fulcrum applied between the force and the load. And the force and the load are balanced. But when you apply more force, applied force, in a downward direction, it's going to be able to lift up um, the the load. And so an example of this is basically how we're able to hold our head up like this, the fulcrum being the, uh, the occipital uh, connection uh, down here between our vertebrae and the, uh, the occipital uh, bone of our, of our skull. 
and the load is our head and the fulcrum again is right there and then these muscles when they when they're contracting are able to in the neck are able to to balance the load so that's an example of a first class lever now the wheelbarrow as i mentioned before uh, has the load coming down the fulcrum is, is is over here notice the fulcrum is away from the load and the applied force this is an example in the body of uh, plantar flexion so in other words the the load is the weight of the body and the force is is being put on by your by your calves right here right like flexing right here and allowing them to uh, lift the large weight okay so it's a small force moving a large weight and that's an example of as you can see here's the load and here's the applied force it's a wheelbarrow example of a, sec a second class lever now the third class lever is the most common in the body and, and there's a few reasons for that that I hope that I will illuminate make clear so the center um, applied force between the load and the fulcrum and so what, what what does this mean so if you're trying to for example lift up something with your wrist the the axis right over here uh, is your is basically your fulcrum right in here in this area the force is being applied by the contraction of your biceps and that's going to cause uh, the the load to be uh, alleviated and lift up lift up so it's it's basically a greater force um, moves a smaller load and so what what is meant by that is like for example if you're trying to lift a nail out of a piece of wood using your hammer you'll notice here at the end is the fulcrum the applied force is uh, is here okay so as you can see in this diagram and what you're trying to do is is yank the nail out of the wood which is the same mechanism that the arm uses when it's lifting up something so the applied force is the biceps brachii muscle the fulcrum here is the elbow joint and therefore you're able to lift up the load and so uh, <laughs> earlier I was trying to like the the rock that throws at a castle a catapult <laughs> is is what I was looking for sorry about being goofy about that so uh, here's the fulcrum again over on the side uh, the applied force and then throwing the rock like in other words a third class lever and so I, I mentioned to you before the reason that it's most common in the body is is uh, twofold it, it permits the muscle to produce distance of movement with minimal muscle shortening although at a sacrifice of the force okay? and 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 furthermore muscle insertions okay in other words uh, the attachment point right here of on the bone that is moving is usually found close to the joint and therefore the effort is located uh, between the fulcrum and the resistance or what the what the load is uh, is putting on okay so you might be wondering uh, about the term insertion which is a good segue uh, let's talk about origins and insertions and so when a muscle contracts the bone that is moves is called the insertion point okay so let me repeat that so when the muscle contracts the bone that is moving is called the muscles insertion point so we have origins and insertions so muscles have one fixed point of attachment on the bone and that's the origin and the one that's moving uh, the moving part point of attachment is the insertion so let's take a look at that so most muscles originate or insert on the skeleton okay now origin is usually proximal to the insertion so in other words that's closer to the central core of the body so you can see here the bicep is uh, origin is the head of the humerus right here in the arm and the insertion point is here in the radius so therefore the insertion will is the is the bone that is moving okay so when you're lifting the arm up so so a flexion like this is a pulling effort so the movement's always going to be a pull no matter what so it's the movement that's a pull with the insertion bone being drawn toward the origin bone so that's that is very important so hopefully that that's making uh, sense or, or is totally clear so if it's important we should back it up with a couple of examples and i and i'm happy to do so uh, 
So, so one of the things that's kind of a little bit odd is like when you're doing this uh, form of exercise, which is known as a push-up, it's really not pushing. <laughs> yeah, muscles aren't really capable of, of pushing. They're really just capable of pulling. And so that, that's something that I wanted to mention. You're like, I hope that's intriguing to you. So what's happening here is the pectoral pectorialis major, this major muscle here in the chest, when it's contracting, it's pulling its insertion, that which is the top of the humerus, toward the immobile origin, which is your sternum. And that's actually what's causing uh, the pull, which is allowing you to be lifted in a push-up. <laughs> okay, so again, what we're discussing right now is muscle muscle action. So movements produced by muscle contraction is basically uh, the big umbrella of this. So again, you know, we're talking about flexing uh, the arm when the bicep is contracting, and we're talking about extending the arm when the tricep is contracting. Okay, so these are examples of actions. And so other examples would be flexion, again, like I was just mentioning, flexing the arm or extending the arm. Flexion, again, is reducing the angle and the flex and extension is increasing the angle at the joint. All right. So we have flexors and, and, and extenders right here. We also have uh, abduct or abductor movements or abduction. In other words, lifting uh, your your arms up as an example of abduction away from the medial um, center of the body and adduct would be bringing it closer. And so in order to achieve this, what we have here is the muscles are interactive. And so muscles work together to sort of maximize their efficiency. I find this to be pretty cool. Muscle terminology based on this function is like it, you have these primary movers and they're agonists. Okay, so the primary movers of, an, of, of a muscle action. Then we have an antagonist hmm, and a synergist. So these are the three kinds that we're going to be discussing. An agonist is the primary mover, so it produ produces a particular movement. So basically, it's, it's the primary ones responsible for the movement are called the, the primary movers or agonist muscles. So another example, jumping jacks. Everyone's familiar with this and sort of like lifting the arms up. In other words, uh, abducting the arms and adducting the arms. And likewise, uh, the legs are doing the same thing. So when you're, when, when, if you do a jumping jack, what you'd be using is your pectoral muscles in the chest and your latissimus dorsi in your back to adduct your arms back to your sides. So those would be primary movement for, or primary movers or agonist for the adduction phase of a jumping jack, okay? So those are your primary movers or agonists pectoral uh, muscles and, and of the chest and latissimus dorsi. Now, an agonist, antagonist, are muscles that are opposing the movement of the agonist. So these are working sort of in reverse to a particular movement by either staying relaxed or stretching or contracting just enough to keep the primary movers from overextending. So one's contracting, the other ones are not. So in the case of the jumping jack, the antagonists would include deltoids, which are again over here on your shoulder. Uh, and that, among other things, uh, what they do is they slow down the, your arms uh, so that they're not slapping your thigh too fast or too hard. So when it comes time to moving your arms in an upward direction in the jumping jack or abduction of your arms over your head, the primary movers become the deltoids and, and you're and there, then your pecs and your lats switch to becoming antagonists. So they, so they reverse roles. I, th that's, I find that to be pretty interesting. So the muscles are basically working in opposition. You have your agonists and your antagonists working in pairs. And so um, one contracts, the other one stretches. And so example of that is flexors and extenders or abductors or adductors, etc. So another example just to sort of, you know, finish this is when you're again flexing a load right here you're lifting a ball up the bicep is uh, is the flexor and it's it's the uh, agonist and notice here the tricep is relaxing so it's the antagonist 
hopefully that's clear. So another, another picture uh, illustrating this, the bicep is contracting, it pulls the, the forearm up, and therefore the tricep muscle is relaxing. So this is the agonist antagonist. Uh, likewise, when the triceps are contracting and they become the primary movers for extension right there, and therefore the biceps are the ones being relaxed. Now the synergist is a, a smaller muscle generally that assists the larger agonist. And it, it, it sort of, in, in some ways, it helps to start the, uh, the motion in general. And it also helps to stabilize the origin of the agonist. And in that case, it acts as a, as a fix, fixer, okay? And fi fixator, I'm sorry. In other words, they, they help the primary mover either by lending them a little extra hand and a little extra energy, if you will, and stabilizing the joint against uh, like a dislocation, like for example, in the joint, like in the, the jumping jack, a good example of that. So the ro rotator cuff mu muscles are sort of these little helpers that sort of stabilize the joint and help a little bit uh, with the agonist. And so, um, for example, the tra uh, trace minor is, is an example of a synergist and the jumping jack helping helping out. Okay, so hopefully that was uh, uh, clear and uh, you learned a little bit about muscle action. And thanks for watching.